Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the Crisis of Caring Conference on the Humanities and Our Health that is being presented by the National Humanities Center. I am Deirdre Cooper Owens, the Charles and Linda Wilson Professor in the History of Medicine and Director of the Humanities and Medicine Program at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I'm also Director of the Program in African American History at the Library Company of Philadelphia. My work examines the medical lives of enslaved women in the antebellum era in the United States and its intersections with contemporary reproductive justice issues. I'll be moderating today's panel on access and inclusivity in American medicine, which includes my fellow presenters, Jeremy Green, Diane Million, and Steph Schuster. So I'll begin by um, giving you a little information about them. Jeremy is the William H. Welch Professor of Medicine and History of Medicine, Director of the Institute of the History of Medicine and Founding Director of the Center for Medical Humanities and Social Medicine at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He is a member of the core faculty in the Johns Hopkins Drug uh, Access and Affordability Initiative, associate faculty at the Berman Institute of Bioethics, and holds joint appointments in the Department of History of Science and Technology and the Department of Anthropology. Jeremy's recent work examines how electric, electronic, and digital media have transformed the nature of medical practice and medical knowledge. Diane Million is Associate Professor and Chair of American Indian Studies at the University of Washington, where she is also affiliated in Canadian Studies the Comparative History of Ideas Program, and the English Department. Diane's recent research explores the politics of mental and physical health with attention to affect as it informs, as it informs race, class, and gender in Indian country. Finally, Steph Schuster is an assistant professor at Michigan State University in the Lyman Briggs College and the Department of Sociology. Their current research in gender medicine and feminist science and technology studies considers how health professionals approach patients who seek gender affirming care. This work is the subject of their recent book, Trans Medicine, the Emergence and Practice of Treating Gender. Jeremy also has a book out. So I would just wanna give a shout out to, to our two brilliant scholars who are coming out with new works. So I welcome all of you and those of you who are viewing this via YouTube and in Zoom land. So we will begin with a discussion among panelists and address audience questions in the last 30 minutes of our session. For those of you who are viewing on YouTube, feel free to enter questions or comments in the chat at any time. But I have to tell you, I sometimes don't play by the rules. So if you enter questions in the chat, I might read them before the 30 minutes is up. All right, so with that, I'll begin. What insights, and this is for all of the panelists, and uh, just as an FYI, I, I'm moderating, but I'm also a panelist as well. So what insights does your research yield that can help us grapple with the current political landscape as it intersects with health inequalities? Do you want someone just to volunteer? <laughs> Anybody can go, because I, I, I can yeah, answer. I'll, I'll I want to <laughs> um, Duinta, my name's Diane Millian, and I'm really happy to be in this conversation. Um, my book is called Therapeutic Nations, Healing in an Age of Indigenous Human Rights, and it has to do with actually how is it that we survive the evisceration of our peoples, our lands, our nations, and um, I think mostly when uh, Indigenous peoples are mentioned or Native peoples here in the United States and Canada, um, most usually those people who engage with this want to go immediately into deficits. Um, they want to talk about the deficits. Um, and those are certainly actually um, the underlying reasons for um, a profound um, uh, health uh, inequalities across the United States and Canada. And so, you know, I, I can't go anywhere with this without noting that. 
et cetera. But I think a, a better question to ask is how it is it that we survived? Um, how is it that we thrived actually? Um, and that's a much more complex question because it's not over. Um, most of us at this point understand that the effort of the United States to continue to eviscerate our um, homelands, to eviscerate our families, meaning you know tear apart, destroy our families, um, destroys our ways of life are very active and thus still have an ongoing effect on our health. Um, but there are many ways in which you know, indigenous peoples right now are not one thing. I, I mean, to racialize American Indian peoples is to actually not understand the huge diversity that we are across many locations, many geographies, uh, urban, and, urban and rural. And so I think it becomes a really complex question about what each uh, community has done, what are the unequals and equal equality questions that have arisen arisen from those different geographies, places, and people's hearts. So I'm just gonna stop without you know going into a big speech here, but I'll throw that out first. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I, I can I can go. Um, so a lot of my work is in how medical providers grapple with uncertainty um, given the given the fraught evidence that exists within trans medicine and medical decision-making, especially when it comes to blocking or initiating gender-affirming care. Um, I think right now, if we look at the political landscape, and this probably hasn't escaped many people's attention, <laughs> that the question of evidence is playing out in a lot of the state legislators um, when it comes to uh, trans youth accessing gender-affirming care. Um, I remember in, in, it was probably a few weeks before I sent the book to my editor um, and was finished with it. And that was when Arkansas first passed legislation. Um, and I called my editor and I was like, Eileen, <laughs> I say in my book that the evidence in trans medicine is fraught and there's not great evidence. And there's a lot of scientific interpretation that happens. That's the exact same logic that these state legislators are using as a justification for blocking trans youth from accessing care. Like, we have to stop the book, <laughs> you know? And she was like, no, no, we can't do that. Um, but I think it's, it's partly about, for me, I think a lot about how, yes, the evidence is fraught, but when, you, when we speak with medical providers who work with trans people, whether they're adults or youth, that there might be a lot of uncertainty um, about, best course of action. Um, there might be a lot of uncertainty about how do we grapple with non-binary people um, or those who don't identify as women or men, but somewhere in between or outside. Um, but there is clear evidence when it comes to the mental health consequences of blocking trans youth and also trans adults from accessing gender affirming care and doing so in a way that can build positive, potentially positive relationships with providers. Um, so I, I think it's it's there, um, and I think there's also a lot of links, and I'll be curious as you know our conversation unfolds about how, even though I study, for example, trans medicine, that there's historical legacies that track through a lot of different marginalized communities, um, and that it's a shared it's a shared history. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to jump in as well, and thank you, Diane and Stefan. I, I love that we're using first names. I also want to recognize the intense amount of work that's gone into your collective scholarship as well. I, I find myself resonating with a phrase that Diane just said of looking at many complex geographies, urban and rural. And I think that this is a question that often comes to my mind as a historian of technology and medicine. And I'm, a, I'm also a practicing um, primary care doc. I, I, I do an urgent care clinic in a community health center in East Baltimore. And I see many folks who are uninsured and uninsurable. And so think about different kinds of social categories and structures that get built that create steep landscapes of divides into who can even come to the table and accessing healthcare and then what kind of healthcare is accessed in that space and whether the healthcare system is perceived as helpful or more violent. Um, but intermixed in all of this is a sense um, that new tech will solve the problems of access that have been produced by centuries of injustice. And I think that 
In this conversation, you know, understanding to what extent um, well-meaning actors, liberal reformers who, who still understand they're dealing with deep, deep social problems, right? Deep social problems are the results of centuries of settler colonialism, of the legacies of enslavement, of st structural racism that has been built up in different forms in different generations, of anti-immigration sentiments and structures, of sexism, of problems of who gets to find access through questions of disability, that there's still this appeal that the right tech will solve the problem. And I don't mean to suggest it's a naive appeal. I think it's also appeal of how do we start engaging with such massive problems if there is a cheap technology at hand that could make things a little bit better, well, shouldn't we actually investigate that? And so the, the, the book that I've just finished is, is a book called The Doctor Who Wasn't There, uh, Technology History and the Limits of Telehealth. And it's about trying to understand, you know, I, I became a teledoctor during the pandemic. I think about a quarter of the American population became telepatients in the pandemic. But um, I mean, Diane, you, you, may, you may know that a lot of the early experiments in developing telemedical systems were done um, on indigenous lands in both Alaska and in Arizona and, and elsewhere. And so there's, there's a strange interconnection of, of how demonstration projects to set up the promise of technology are built in the beginning of the technology versus how they're followed through. Um, and this is something I'd love to get into this conversation is, which of these problems can be solved by technology? But then again, if we just say, well, the technological fix is a mistake, what possibilities are we foreclosing? Is it the technology that's the problem or is it the promises that are made and not followed through and how we actually govern um, who gets access to technology and who steers its fate when we talk about, about our health? Uh, thank, thank you. As I was thinking about this, this question, um, you know, I do a lot of work not just in the academic sense, but also um, a lot of public work with communities outside of academia, where as a historian of slavery and gender history, primarily women's history and medicine, I'm constantly trying to contextualize a, a past that's sometimes been hidden or marginalized for medical professionals, especially clinicians and nurses and birth workers. And so a large part of, of my work, I, I wrote a book on the history of uh, the development of American gynecology and its intersection with slavery is really shifting a conversation and focus on what I call historical boogeymen. So kind of laying the blame of these inequities and atrocities uh, and anti-black black practices on one person's you know, feet but really talking about it as a structural and systemic problem. That the ways that you know, reproductive medicine in this country was really developed um, so quickly was because the, the foundation of obstet obstetrics and gynecology was so closely linked to slavery, which was anti-Black, <laughs> so closely related to these racialized, uh, gendered, sexist ideas about women, you know, women and their anatomy um, and biological difference between black and white people. And so once I'm able to contextualize that, I think things become clearer for folk when we start to, to use terms like this is structural, this is systemic with, with the regard of the legacy of medical racism. And so you then start to see people saying, ah, okay, so it's, it's anti-Blackness, you know, in the case of the groups that I look at, or it's, it's medical racism, that's the negative social determinant. And I'm like, yes, it's always been, right? And so the one thing that keeps me hopeful in the political landscape because of COVID-19 being the kind of big revealer of all of these racialized health inequities the CDC in April 2021 finally declared racism as a public health crisis, right? It finally listened to all of these folk that we write about, that we talk about, that we, you know, that we are members of, of those groups. It finally said, you know what? The evidence is kind of damning here. And so perhaps it's time for us to stop playing politics and actually state, you know, as people say in my Southern community, just state a thing is a thing. Right, and that is really racism that is the public health crisis. And if we can begin from there, at least I think there's there's a way to remain hopeful about what can possibly be transformed, even on the smallest level. Mm -hmm. Diane, I saw you unmuted. Did you want to add to that before we move on to the next question? I apologize for being unmuted. Oh, 
know that. that I would love to sure. follow up on what you said, if it's possible. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, it goes right there. It actually helps um, also segue kind of into what Jeremy was pointing to. And that is the fact that, you know, in Alaska or in the Arctic, um, in the in Canadian Arctic and of course what became Alaska, one of the situations there was is there was a ready population which could be experimented on. And so we had helicopter doctors, we had helicopter experimenters basically. They flew in in small planes and brought their medicine practices with them of course. And the problem actually there was that they did not, they didn't um, pay any attention to the social form that was in place. And so they didn't treat us. They were like treating ills that they were causing at the same time they were there, which were similar to the way in which black um, peoples were um, also similarly experience, experienced being experimented on. Um, and that, that this, this never totally changed, you know? And so the idea of access, just access, I mean, I think, I think that's a big point that I wanna bring in here. Just the access to medicine alone has never um, alleviated any of the issues in which medicine has actually caused on the ground or the kinds of medicine we're speaking of here um, has caused on the ground. Um, which is not to say that um, indigenous bills don't try to um, actually utilize technology, um, but our point is, is that technology has to actually enhance our own uh, ways of, of our, our own social uh, ideas of what health is, okay, or healing is. And so that, that's where I would go into it. And, you know, to your, um, your point, Stephanie, that's one of the things we're saying is, is, is that we were extremely diverse peoples with large ranges of gender and sexuality among us. And one of the things that happened, of course, that caused so much hell, hell was is this uh, restriction of gender, of, of sexual practices, of, of uh, marriages uh, among families um, to our, in, our own, in our own ways. And that was what we called the evisceration of our societies and the repression of things that once you know, made us whole. Uh, and so I just wanna bring that in really quickly. So it's a little bit more complex here, I keep using that word, but it, but it is here and you understand this in this conversation than just the technology itself. I agree with you, Jeremy. Uh, it is actually who gets to use this technology to what reason into what formation in, in people's homes. Yes. So thank you. And so for those of us who are just joining, I'd like to, to just introduce our panelists again. We have Diane, Diane excuse me, Millian, Jeremy Green, and Steph Schuster. Uh, I'm Deirdre Cooper Owen. So I'm gonna go on. We had so many juicy things that I could, I could kind of clench on to, but I, you know, I'm thinking about the name of this particular conference. And so we're in the midst of a crisis of caring, health inequities and a pandemic that we don't know will, when it will end. But how do we create practices that can begin to chip away at what builds resilience in so many caregivers and providers? As all of us are aware, resilience is born out of things meant to harm us. So whether it's a health crisis, medical racism, and a list of the other things that we mentioned regarding access, definitions of what uh, safe health is, um, all phoenixes don't rise from the ashes. So how do we create those practices that can chip away at what builds resilience in so many caregivers, providers? And then I would also add academics. I, you know, I, I'll, I'll go, I'll go. What, what I hear from a lot of folk um, that I speak with, and I, I tend to speak to um, medical organizations, medical schools, nurses, um, and then birth workers, especially black doulas. And especially for black women and birthing people, a lot of the complaints that just kind of wear them down, A, is being 
mired in work where, you know, as Diane noted um, in, in her beginning comments, you're mired in work that is really about deficiencies and death and lots of negative things. But beyond that, you're also dealing with a, a medical industry that has not for centuries listened to or believed its patients, especially when they are, when they're black, when they're women, when they're poor. I mean, I can go on and on when they're immigrant. And so you have to build up a kind of resilience, which has always been praised, but for many of them, they're like, can we just be fragile? Can we be vulnerable? Can we just have healthcare that's quality, right? They're not asking for magic formulas. They're literally saying, we just wanna be heard and we wanna believe, be believed, we wanna be respected. Um, and so I think a large part of it is the ways that at least I'm seeing Black um, women and women identified people kind of chipping away at some of those structural inequalities is institution building. Uh, they're doing a lot of um, really forward thinking uh, practices, creating apps where you can track your experiences on, you know, for black and brown people in particular uh, on, on social media, using app stores with your Androids, your, your, your Apple smartphones. They are creating artistic works that uh, build upon the legacy of, of black women who were enslaved, who added to uh, medical branches and development. So I see them really using the blueprint of their ancestors in terms of institution building. Um, and, and they're doing it on their own terms. And so that's one way I think we can just listen and also tap into the blueprint that's been left for us by our ancestors that have always worked. And within the black community, I suspect in many others, it's been that kind of institution building as, Di as Diane mentioned, on your own terms. You are the one who frames the definition and you also are not arrogant enough to think that the definition stays static. Thanks so much for that. I think part of the reason we were being quiet is, oh, I, I, I wanted to hear what, what, um, what Diane would say in answer to that question. And we, we, you know, we're generally a deferential crowd interested in hearing what each other have to say, but Diane, your, your book is all about this question. Um, how do you frame it? Or how do you frame it in a short amount of time? Like in, 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 when you're asked to describe a, a whole book like that. Um, you don't. <laughs> I, I think that what I went after was, you know, what is healing in, um, in a larger sense. And, and I think Deidre, Didi, um, I think really, you know, that that's where you always have to start and not just with the deficits. It's exactly where we rose again, okay? And, um, and whether or not every other people actually see what it is um, that we create when we have self-determination. And so some of the most, um, for me, creative things that are happening, the things that are most hopeful is exactly this. It's where we have organized again. Um, and we're not caught in time. They're not static in time, just as Didi says. We're not, we're not the, the problem I think has been, and I have to you know, continuously speak of native peoples, of indigenous peoples, of my own Alaska native peoples. We're not relics of a past. We're a living societies um, that are quite diverse. And so in our places, uh, we come up with really, really diverse uh, answers to the questions that confront us. In the Arctic, obviously, it's that no infrastructure was ever built there. They didn't mean for us to survive there. They really actually thought we would disappear. And this is really um, the problem across Indian country widely is, no, you know, it's not about cleaning up or making infrastructure better or something. Infrastructure just was never there. And so, uh, it fell to us to attempt to um, make, you know, and self-determination has been a very um, crucial part of that. And that is um, building our own, um, in fact, governments in places. Um, and, and that goes, you know, that's more or less where my book went about uh, particularly the caring field in which native uh, women create, okay, uh, in their communities and uh, LGBTQ and trans peoples, uh, we look to them a lot at this point, 
uh, and to abolition itself, dear Miss Ruthie, anyway, Gilmore, you know what I'm saying, at this point in time, to look for actual answers about what critical care looks like in a reorganization of your society where you still have, you don't everywhere have an infrastructure. Um, so it's quite, there, there's, a, there's beautiful answers coming out of different places. <laughs> I think um, one of the things that you're like that I'm kind of hearing and thinking about around self determination and resilience, these kinds of things, um, is really like that point of trust and mistrust um, between people in like the medical establishment. Um, like I think about <clears throat> in the mid 20th century as trans people are more and more so meeting each other, networking sharing tips about what to say to a provider because at that time it was assumed that um you know uh, that that being a trans person was a symptom of schizophrenia and delusional thinking and that you know these like these people just wake up and you know decide they want to be another gender um and i think what's interesting in in like that relationship of trust and mistrust um that is still present uh, in a lot of medical spaces, especially when it comes to trans people, is that there's still kind of this, there's still these ideas that some medical providers have just not let go of, that, you know, there's all this discussion of regret um, and that trans people don't really understand themselves, their bodies, um, that some medical providers assume that their job is to fix people. <laughs> um, but, but also, you know, in interviewing providers who work with trans people, there is a small segment who are able to be a little more flexible um, and lean into the knowledge that trans people have of their own bodies and lives. Um, and I think it's interesting to consider, like, what does self-determination look like in a medical area where I mean, and this like this is something that I I think a lot about in trans medicine. Providers are not they're not addressing an illness or a disease. Like they're working with people's social identities um, and to help help people have the bodies and lives that they imagine for themselves. Um, and so it's just like a crucial point of tension that even though the premise of trans medicine is based on self determination, it's also just this consistent pattern of a lot of medical providers who don't trust the trans and non-binary people know themselves or their bodies or their identities. Um, and, and what I've noticed over time is that it seems like there are a lot more opportunities and maybe this is just in Jeremy bringing you into the conversation, um, the advantages and also limitations of different technological possibilities where trans and non-binary people can communicate more with each other and share notes and offer ideas for what, what medicine can look like and feel like if one is in front of a doctor who's affirming um, through things like social media and, and just sharing information. So. That's such an important link you're putting in there, Steph, because I think each of these um, spaces of communication, right? opens up a new possibility for participatory, liberatory, you know, forms of open and more transparent governance to make our healthcare system live up to the values that it has claimed for itself for a very long time, right? And yet, as so many of you are des describing, the, the, you know, the healthcare system is built, um, you know, to, you know, defend certain principles and enact other violences and, you know, has for such a long time embodied principles, not only of white supremacy, but all kinds of other ableist, you know, uh, gender normative means. And and, um, and I, I'm thinking about the statement you've made it's sort of at the beginning of your remarks, Diane, right? Which is, I would kind of par paraphrase as, you know, access to what, right? So like, like we, if we look at the title of this panel, like there's a sense that, well, once you get in and once you get access to healthcare, then these, these steep asymmetries that produce health disparities can go away. But I think one of the challenges that a field like social medicine, which I think, you know, as, as, as Edie is capturing, you know, many physicians, many health professionals don't know this field of social medicine, right? They don't know the variety of ways in which the structures have been written that produce the health outcomes that we are seeing 
and they have been written such that they are rendered invisible to those who inhabit them. Um, and so I find myself thinking a little bit about um, like Topkapi Palace, right? The Sultan's Palace in, in Istanbul or the Forbidden City um, in, in Beijing, which you go through a gate and then you're in a courtyard and then there's another gate and you get through that gate and there's another courtyard and you get through another one. And it takes, there's so, so much attention to getting through these gates that it's not kind of clear to you at which point you're really finally inside. Um, and, and then I, I mentioned this just because your, your comments point out that, you know, access to a system that then reenacts other forms of violence is not necessarily producing health. It's not producing health, right? Um, and so what, is the, what are the other things that need to come with access to make access meaningful? And are they summed up in this term inclusivity? Or is there something else that we can say that is really necessary so that our healthcare system actually produces equity? Yeah, thank, thank you for that. Because it brings us to the next question and it, it taps into a, a bit of what all of, all of us have shared, right? I'm, I often think about the ways that hospital administrators can transform um, the medical system. And in a medical system that, that Jeremy says, and this is such an eloquent term, right? That, that has these asymmetries written into it that are invisible, right? That help to create all of these disparities that we're talking about. And so, what are the ways that you would suggest? Um, and Jeremy, I think I'm going to ask you to start first, only because I, at least I think you are the only practicing <laughs> clinician on the panel. Um, but what are the ways that we can transform um, the ways that these hospital administrators think about health, or not think about the practices that are harmful um, to so many to so many people? You know, so if we had a magic wand. What could we enact? Yeah, thank, thanks for that. I, I, <laughs> I'm not gonna have a short answer, but I'll, I'll, but I'll, be, I'll be quick though, knowing that all of us together will come up with something. I, first, I wanna say, I, you, clearly you're all given, you're all involved in providing care. So, so even if I, I may be the only licensed healthcare practitioner on this panel, it is clear to me that all of you are involved in different forms of care that you're doing in a variety of communities. Um, I think that, that, that I've been thinking about this a lot lately of where we are in this moment where it is all too easy for us to hit kind of a receding or a revanchist moment in which the kinds of promises and attestations that are made immediately after the outcry after the murder of George Floyd can begin to like just collapse into these acronyms that we have now created, right? DEI, I dare, and then be attached to a person within a bureaucracy and not actually lead to meaningful outcomes. And so I think the forms of pressure that need to be brought to bear are just to such that, that healthcare cannot be considered healthcare without attention to, deli to delivering on, on, these, on these promises. That um, in some ways I, I find that, at least in, within the institution that is medical education, we find that we're in a situation where medical school faculty are now recognizing that their students come to the classroom demanding a, compl a complex engagement with social determinants of health, with structural racism, with a complex biosocial formation that is the embodiment of racial difference, of ethnic health disparities, of disparities across uh, gender and sexuality and trans care. And faculty are uncomfortable because they feel they're not prepared. So in some ways, I think that the generational change that is happening through expectations is helping to put pressure on institutions to transform and creating opportunities for those of us that work in social medicine to actually try and follow through with that change. So that's the, that's the answer I'd give right now. Diane. I um, was thinking, I wanna talk about, you know, like really grounded examples here. And I think of Alaska Native Health Consortium and um, I, I think about it because it um, has been put up as an example of what we do with our sovereignty and our self-determination because we built from the ground up then our values into the healthcare that was given there. The problem with the Western health system for us has been that it only recognized individuals, that it was an embodied individual type of thing. And we don't think of health that way. For us, health is a really holistic concept, which brings in, it's interesting because the WHO, the World Health Organization had brought that before saying it's not just the absence of illness, it's the 
health of the biosystem. It's the health of the families. It's the health of the everything that makes, we're not truly individuals. We're made up of, of our ancestors, our families, our, our seven generations before us were, we, and unless they're involved in the planning, you know what I'm saying, or the actual treatment of whatever is being called an illness or whatever, then then you can't change the the formation, the formation around the individual, and it's the individual's responsibility, you know, to you know carry out. That's very um, different than the way we think about health. I really love this one. I I kind of had captured this statement out of an Anupiak, this really young Anupiak woman um, who is now uh, a um, social welfare worker said, for the love of our children and an, an indigenous connectedness framework, despite colonization, something has sustained indigenous peoples. Answering, um, she says um, that the keys to indigenous survival and well-being has been to revitalize our whole kinship networks. And so it's for us, it was like, it's very specific to what, whether or not we can resurge those things that make us whole, which are not individual, which, uh, which is why we need, you know what I'm saying, not to just be included in a system that only would, you know, not would only ever look at just the illness and, and the one person's body in front of them and not recognize, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the complex amount of relationships that is this person or, you know, in front of them. Seth, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I guess um, just kind of thinking with Jeremy and Diane for a second, um, I th I think sometimes what happens. So I'm I'm imagining my magical wand here, <laughs> and I think sometimes what happens is that when trans and non-binary folks show up in the clinic, that it's assumed that their only health need is gender affirming care. Um, and so in thinking about like the holistic health needs of sorry, and I've been trying to keep my cat like down, but. She no, needs to get out. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I think like what happens sometimes is that um, if medical providers are not even just beginning in the early days of medical education, not exposed to, not introduced to, not brought into conversations around the idea that there are more people who are whose gender is beyond cisgender women and men. Um, and maybe that looks like with case studies that, you know, a trans person is represented in that case study who shows up in the clinic because they have pink eye or there's a non-binary person who has cancer or, you know, like just it, it's, it's kind of this strange in-between state, I think, that trans and non-binary people are in where on one hand, medical providers have a really hard time seeing us as humans who have a whole plethora of health needs and also like, you know, gender affirming care. Um, so I think if I had a wand, I would kind of bridge the ideas between it needs to begin on the first day of medical education and not the one diversity day where, you know, students are introduced to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and queer people. Um, so yeah, I, you know, this is something that I've, I've often asked. Um, if I had a magic wand, it, it does start with medical education, I agree. But what I often show people, the, 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 the statistics in the report show that people are coming into schools of nursing and medical schools and all, all other kinds of dental schools, you know, professional schools with ideas that are rooted in oppression and bias and racism and discrimination. So I often use a 2016 study that came out of UVA, Dr. Kelly Hoffman. And, and you know, I see everybody kind of shaking their heads. It made a huge splash when it came out. It's from the 21st century, not the 20th, not the 19th, not the 18th, not the 17th. So I often tell very well-meaning 
white folk in the audience who are like, well, what can we do? I'm like, stop raising children who are anti-Black. Because these people are coming in with four-year degrees. And so they're willfully choosing to believe Black people have, are, are biologically distinctive from white people. They're choosing to believe that Black people are born with tails, have thicker skin, don't experience pain. I mean, they, because the thing is, all four of us are published authors. Jeremy and Diane have published more than once, right, in, in terms of monographs. We have been teaching in the social sciences and in the humanities for decades that race is not a biological construct. These students are coming from universities and getting into some of the country's top ranked medical school programs, and they're coming in with these beliefs. That is an intentional choice. That means that there is the embrace of transphobia or homophobia or anti-blackness or anti-indigeneity, um, you know, elitism based on class. That means that the allure of that is more powerful than the facts that we have. And also scientists have been stating for decades. And so for me, I'm saying medical education is great. That's what I do, you know, I consult. But at the end of the day, it's not gonna change people's minds. What does change minds are punitive policies. We're all professors. If we dated our students, if we sexually harassed our students, I don't care about endowments or tenure, we would eventually lose our jobs and we might be sued. If we were attorneys and we did things that were illegal and ethical, we can you know, become disbarred. What are the punitive policies that need to be put into place so that people are accountable? Because I, we are not changing their hearts. I always say, let their spiritual advisors do that. Right. We've been we've been producing this this we've been producing information that tells them things that are fact based, that are ethical, that are caring. So what are the punitive policies that can be put into place so that hospitals that are constantly harming people that constantly show up on the list as the worst places for for treatment? How can we hold them accountable and remove dangerous people from killing human beings? So that's. That's what I would hope could happen. Um, I, you know, I tend to be a little passionate. Oh, my God, I want to follow you up on that one. Yeah, please. <laughs> you know, I've been teaching in, in this American Indian Studies Department for 19 years. And I was a public educator before that in the communities. And I became interested when I was really young, because I believed then that all we had to do was educate them. <laughs> that all we had to do was tell them, you know what I'm saying, that they were wrong um, or, you know, give them more information uh, or something like that. Well, at this point, I have an incredible um, depth of experience with that. And unfortunately, I have to totally agree with you the problem is, is that every single year I teach hundreds of young people that know absolutely nothing about us except for, you know, gross stereotypes. We still live in igloos. No, this is really it. This is the actual fabric of the society we live in, which is why I won't let people get off the hook which is why I'm an abolitionist, which is why I'm a person who forms alliances with other people who are anti-racist, anti-homophobic, anti-settler um, colonial, um, against people who are, or who only look at skin or difference or any of the other kinds of differences. And this is why I called it um, healing in an age of, of human rights, because the problem with some of this is extremely deep around who has ever been human, who has ever been treated as a human, who has ever achieved humanity, okay? And so I, I agree with you. Um, I'm not quite sure the system can police itself. And I think that's what I fear the most is, is that because it serves the subject that it was set up to serve, um, you know, and which I, I won't berate. I think we're talking knowing about what subject it was set up to serve and still does.
Yeah, I mean, Diane, I, I really appreciate that. And one thing I was thinking about um, is like, like when I think about health structures and infrastructures, there's there's a tendency to absorb um, the demands of underrepresented and marginalized groups. Um, so I'm curious to hear like the other folks' thoughts about when it comes to things like DEI initiatives um, and, and also like holding, you know, in, in DD, you were talking about, um, sorry, none of my cats like really distracting me. Um, how, for example, okay, so like if hospital administrators are, you know, they're like, okay, we're going to address the systemic racism that exists in our hospital system from the top down um, and all across the process. I, like what I think about is that a lot of health infrastructures can absorb inclusivity and equity demands by doing a small task and then patting themselves on the back and saying, look, we did our job. Um, we are better now. We have improved. We have progressed. Um, and it, I don't know, like, I'm just curious about where are those moments and those overlaps where there's real structural change happening and not kind of a shallow effort to really address the deeply rooted inequities that exist in healthcare. Yeah, thank you. You know what, and what I'm gonna do, I just put this in. So I'm gonna shift, this is such a great conversation. So I'm gonna shift to start focusing on questions from our virtual audience, but Steph, uh, Samantha Pinto, and I gotta give a shout out. Hey Sam, we went to UCLA together. <laughs> hey girl, <laughs> anyway. Um, the, Steph's question intersects neatly, I think, with Samantha's that says, you know, where might we place the current waves of legislation against women's reproductive choice in conversation with, with con, in conversation with racial health inequities and anti-trans youth and CRT legislation? Because I think what we've all been talking about, they're all intersected, they're all linked. So in light of what Steph said and what Samantha has has added to that, where are we with this? Oops, I, I said you stomped us, Steph and Samantha. Who wants to go? I, I'm interested in if, if Steph wants to answer their own question and Sam's to begin, because I feel like there's more of an answer in there than you're than you're hinting at. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, like I, I do think about overlapping systems of oppression and and where, but also I think a lot about where we can find tiny, like tiny. In my mind, I just imagine like tiny grappling hooks into systemic change and even changing conversations. Um, but I also worry about, um, okay, so shifting out of healthcare for a second, a lot of people are like, and I know that it's contentious, um, but gay marriage, great. Like we have, we're good. We have, we can move on now. Um, and what happens is that when I think mainstream platform issues are achieved, then it's like, Oh yeah, 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 but we'll get to the racism in queer communities next, or yeah, 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 we'll get to the trans stuff next, or so I don't know. I mean, I, I think that the the attempts to pull it back into healthcare to address one issue at a time is is just going to be a failed strategy, um, and that if we're talking about systemic change and and deep rooted structural change, that it's not only about I mean, it reminds me a lot, actually, of like the reproductive justice movement, um, which really takes at its center focus, thinking carefully about how oppression is intersectional, and that to try to address and dismantle racism, we also must consider classism. And in order to do that, we must also, you know, so I don't know. I mean, where I get concerned is thinking about the corporatization of things like diversity and equity where it's like, let's roll out this new policy that you know, reaffirms our commitment to the principles of DEI. Um, and meanwhile, the broader structural problems are still present. So I'm not sure if I have the answer, but I think that in just noticing patterns of oppression and how it travels over time in the institution, that addressing racism must also be 
a justice movement that thinks about and grapples with other forms of oppression, such as classism, and the ways that they're intertwined in, and share those historical legacies. So, yeah, I think that's a, that's a that's such an important answer, Stefan. I'll just insert just brief in terms of an example of this is, uh, you know, a book I admire a lot by uh, the sociologist Marin Clowder called On the Biopolitics of Breast Cancer, in which uh, Clowder shows different kinds of activism that gets linked around breast cancer, sort of with the Susan Komen Foundation and the Pink Ribbon Campaign on the end of the most corporate and the most sort of easily digestible and the least kind of coherently able to engage with systemic violence. And then on the other end, you know, forms of much more radical entities that engage with ecological pollutions that are producing breast cancer. Like so, so how does one allow a pink ribbon, ribbon to go on a product that is producing carcinogens and disseminating them through the environment and causing more breast cancer, right? It's like the, the ability to create that insulation is the danger of the segmentation of, of, of efforts in these areas. And that risk is, very, is so there for DEI. And, and as you're pointing out for mainstream and gay marriage, like it just piecemeal one by one allows the continued elision of the, of, of, of the structures themselves. So thank you for that. I love this conversation, it gets to so many deep things mm -hmm. that, you know, we think about every day, but you know, these, these are difficult things. They're not totally solvable, I think, even by the system itself, because the system, you know, not to um, reify the system, but the system is us. You know what I'm saying? It's not us specifically, maybe, because we're all positioned really differently in it. But the thing of it is, is that one of the answers in Indian country has always been, well, let's throw money at it, but then never have built the actual um, ways in which that money ever actually ever even reaches the people it was meant for. And so everybody goes, oh, well, we just got through, you know, there we've got all these billions of dollars to, you know, pour into, you know, I'm thinking of Biden and, you know, the whole big package, you know, that um, he announced this last year in Indian country and, and, and what the failures, you know, Kyle White is a relief, uh, another really um, well-spoken uh, indig Potawatomi indigenous person who has done a lot of really research, uh, deep research on the way, ways in which the legislation that gets passed sometimes never ever actually affects anyone on the ground because there's all this red tape because of the enormous bureaucracies that have been built up over the last 200, you know, 150 years in which, you know what I'm saying, that we're not which is why we always kind of go to self-determination and sovereignty, but even that, you know, it doesn't reach everyone because not every um, every community of native peoples are, are even organized that way. There's many um, groups of people that are not recognized, et cetera, et cetera. But I think, you know, the intersection though is really important in that what we are speaking of here is something in which um, we have to, social change is not revolution. Social change is the hard work of activism in a moment in time in which you do uh, call attention and help to build, rebuild structures in places um, to try to alleviate what you know is the issue. I would really feel that, you know, that there's a lot of alliances around that right now that I'd like to recognize. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to just for the sake of uh, asking other questions, I'm just going to, to read uh, another question from Don Solomon, who's a part of the virtual audience. Don uh, states and then asks, when institutional healthcare entities have failed or ignored the needs of underserved and oppressed communities, they often have created their own alternatives. For instance, project in form and the buyers clubs formed in response to the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s. What role should those kinds of community-based alternative health solutions serve in helping bridge gaps in care? Um, I'll, I'll just briefly go, my, my area of specialty in, in kind of 21st century uh, reproductive justice issues is always dealing with birth work um, and, and, and reproductive justice care. And so in some major, urban areas with larger black and brown populations, um, a lot of the black doulas 
have created partnerships with hospitals so that doulas can go in and work with birthing people for the various the kind of various needs that they have. Um, but it's very urban based. And so people in rural spaces are often left out, but at least in places like New York and some cities in Northern California, you're starting to see these synergistic relationships form around uh, doula training organizations that have a disproportionately larger representation of, of black, uh, black women and women identified people who are advocating for um, you know, poor folk, people who, who suffer from mental health challenges, um, black people, immigrant people. And so that's, that's one way that I see um, alternative health solutions and community-based solutions working. Okay, not sure. Okay, so I can go on because we had, we're having, oh, go ahead, Jeremy, did you want to go and jump in? I, I just want to jump in just to underscore, I mean, Diane, right at the very beginning said something just so important about the, the models of deficit that we create, right? And how crucial it is to 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 rewrite those narratives, right? And focus on, you know, the, the the many assets that communities possess and the forms of action that are possible. And I think, um, it, it, I mean, I'm, I'm looking in terms of historical work, um, looking at the say the work of uh, Alondra Nelson and highlighting the role of the Black Panther Party and advocating um, health screening programs and how it's a technology like a screening test for sickle cell can mean very different things depending on the network of care and activism that it is suspended within. Um, other scholarship on, uh, by say, Ajama Kola, who's been looking at the neglect of asthma in black communities and the role of black uh, civil rights era activists in pushing forward urban asthma as a public health problem that mainstream medicine was neglecting. Um, of, uh, and, and Evelyn Hammonds is doing similar work looking at the, the wide scale neglect of, and this comes down to the questions of the AIDS community and AIDS activism. There are certain stories that are remembered others that aren't, but especially networks of Black women who rapidly became a, a, a unseen demographic of, of AIDS epidemiology and pushing forward forms of activism. So I think, you know, as historians, we can work to elevate these stories as well, partly because they lead to further forms of action, rather forms of, of, um, of and help to, 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 to kind, of, kind of displace, undo, replace models of deficit into models of action. Thank you. I'm gonna to go to the, the first question that was posed in the chat from Marina. And it was in response to something Diane said, um, kind of in the middle of our conversation when she said, access to what? So Marina says, access to what is a good point and question to consider. By the time people need serious medical care, the upstream causes of health, including inclusive housing have already played a large role. So it's, it's more a, a statement, but I think we can, we can kind of focus on this, you know, access to what? How do we consider that? Um, I, very briefly, I'll just say, and I often use this as a, a anecdotal example, but one that can be substantiated. I, I went to high school in South Carolina in a very rural space in the low country. So that's where the Gullah Geechee people live in South Carolina. I grew up in the poorest county, the blackest county. Um, always connected to, you know, at least since the institutionalization of slavery, always connected to that. My high school's mascot was the golden bow weevil. My high school sat across from a cotton field. And so in 1990, when I graduated high school, the OBGYN ward was eliminated. And so there's not been a permanent OBGYN uh, ward. So if you have a baby, you have to go to the next county, which is 13 miles away, or the next city, which is almost 40 miles away. And if there are problems, we talk about those helicopter doctors, you have to be you know, essentially transported via helicopter to Charleston, which is about 70 miles away. And so when we think about some of the community-based groups, we almost always rely on data from urban spaces, but access might exist in theory, but if it's not in a place like Williamsburg County, South Carolina, where there are no doulas, there are no midwives, there's one OBGYN who accepts patients based on their insurance coverage. How in the world do we think about access and what that actually means? Because who wants to move 
right? Who wants to return to the poorest county in the state where there's no industry, school systems aren't good? I mean, you know, talk about deficits. There, there are a lot of deficits in that particular way. So I think too, maybe adding to that is to think about urbanity and rurality um, when we think about all of these communities that we're talking about. I think when I think about those questions, because I actually addressed it at one time trying to write about it, that you're looking at some places in which capital does not favor. No capital has ever been put there. Um, maybe people have been extracted for their labor or the land has been extracted for the resources there. But again, no infrastructure was ever built and thus it doesn't support all the other life um, supporting things that are there. So I just don't, I think that's kind of a false dichotomy that there's just a natural urban and a natural ur uh, rural or something because I really look at the, the, the at least in the last 150 years, the role capitalism has had in making those places death zones for us, you know what I'm saying? But again, you know, to, to, to still, you know, I do, I'm very much a person that likes to see what people do, you know, besides just move, try to move on, you know what I'm saying? What do they do under those circumstances? They can sometimes, there can be a sometimes amazing thing that can happen there. But I think your question, Didi, is just, spot on, you know, access to what, where, <laughs> okay? Because if there is no where there, there's nothing to access there, then what are we really looking at in these places that uh, that, that capitalism has left, left in that condition? <laughs> so so the, these, I, I, I'm so interested in how we move from the sort of like the problems of the of the atomistic individual, which Dan, I think you named really so so well, right? It's one of the crucial problems of biomedicine, and then the problems of the sort of the giganticness of the forces of capitalism, settler colonialism, structural racism, and how do we create a sphere of action in which people feel they can act? Because sometimes folk can feel helpless in in the macro as well as they feel helpless in the micro. Um, and I think there are so many stories, so many ways of forms of meaningful action that have been taken and can be taken. I, it's it's interesting though. It's like I, I I'm part of my bias here is that I'm engaged in training medical professionals. So I, I I I'm not on the faculty of the School of Public Health across the street, right? And the School of Public Health has its motto: saving lives, millions at a time which is kind of like a direct insult at the School of Medicine, where we just do one at a time, right? Um, and and yet you know, we used to give them. Uh, used to give first year medical students in social medicine, uh, Thomas McCune's uh, The Role of Medicine, which is a searing account that basically suggests that the, the true role of medicine in influencing the health of populations has been grossly overstated, right? And then we realized it was just depressing them and they had all just taken out their loans. And, you know, they're, they were signed up, they were in debt. And, and that medicine offers powerful forms of agency in which, like in the clinic, finding ways to engage with the social as well as the individual kind of powerful transformative action. So I've been trying to focus on what's that middle work, right? Because sometimes if, if you say, well, you're too far downstream, there's nothing that can be done anymore. That's, I believe that's never really true, right? I believe that one should always be trying to work more upstream, but trying to figure out, well, what are the spaces of agency that can still be created at this point for this person, right, in the encounter? And the last thing I'll say in here, because I could talk about this for a long time, is that the space of the social in the medical encounter, as it is taught to medical students at this point in time, is often reduced to a list of bads. So the social history, you know, do you smoke? Do you drink? Are you doing illicit drugs? Who are you having sex with? Like how often and are you using protection, right? So that's, those questions I just asked are considered a more extensive social history than most patients actually get at, but it is not, where do you come from? What is your value system? What are your beliefs? What is your family? Who makes decisions? Who do you think this decision should be made with, right? How does your health impact other people in your household? And how, do they, how does their health affect you? So, so if we can train people to actually get the social history beyond that list of bads into a list of what we, then, then there's so much more space of action that can be generated that also does forms of prevention. What, you know, we, is oftentimes called secondary prevention, right? So sometimes blurring the boundary between upstream and downstream, between One of the things that you're talking about here exists, you know, in some communities, in black and brown communities, and then certainly in native communities. And that is where we have actually integrated our own forms of healthcare 
into that system. And for me, that's the middle ground, you know? Um, you know, I, I, I mean, we could talk, like we said, about the extreme. And I know the extreme, the extreme is like the, the story of King Island, you know what I'm saying? Where they like shut the school down and took all the infrastructure away and which forced everybody eventually to move away from their homeland. They end up in an urban area and resur you know, become res a resurgent community there. But they lose their identity as King Islanders you know, in doing so. So that's the, you know, like maybe based on what we were talking about a little earlier. But then on the other hand, you know what I'm saying? I think, again, just to try to keep it to revitalization, every single one of us that have are, are setting stand or you know being here or whatever like that are the product of a history. We're here because our ancestors or somebody resurged. You know what I'm saying? They made conditions under which, you know, that that made our lives possible. You know what I'm saying? And so I look to my folks and stuff like that. They were not doctors. They weren't, you know, they didn't have any education. You know, they didn't, they didn't, what they did do though is try to make the conditions uh, out of nothing for life for us so that we could continue, um, so that we could confront people in a conversation like this, you know what I'm saying, with what this looks like uh, in terms of what we do actually to survive uh, and not just survive, thrive. And so I th always think that the question there is, is that um, it's power. I'm sorry, but we're always talking about power relations how do we take power relations back in any given situation? And this one is health. You know what I'm saying? How do we integrate? How do we integrate your systems with other systems that have existed? Mm -hmm. I want, you know, I was thinking stuff. Do you want to, do you want to answer that <laughs> from, you know, cause we all are representing our kind of constituent, you know, constituents, you know, the people who we, who we study, right? I'm, I'm black women. You're the trans community, you know. It, so you know, the indigenous community. So um, you know, and Jeremy is a, a doctor, and, and students, and all of these kinds of things. So how would you answer that, though, based on the constituents that you study, you examine, you know, that you're a part of? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I have a. I think a lot of different answers, but I'll try to, you know, because I'm also, I know there's a lot of questions. No, you can do different answers, because I'm thinking about that too. Like, because yeah. Diane said, there's diversity in the groups that we are a part of, that we write about, you know, just because I say Black women, we're not all the same, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so answer it in, you know, as diverse a way as you can. Yeah. I mean, I, like, when it comes to healthcare, I think one of the challenges is, um, if medicine has been on this movement to towards standardization, evidence-based medicine, all these things, like one of the questions I think a lot about is how do you standardize medical decision making for a population that is unstandardizable? Um, and if we like, we could probably spend the next 20 minutes listing out all of the different gender identities and how people relate to their bodies and I, like I think that like it makes it really complicated because there's not with any other group as well. Like there's not a homogenous trans person. Um, so I think part of, you know, in a, a few minutes ago, I had, I had brought up gay marriage and I was like, let me step out of healthcare for a second. But as folks have been talking, I've been thinking about that that maybe is that's part of the point that healthcare does not float out there somewhere, but that there's a lot of different ways that housing and transportation and the economy and like legal system, like all these different institutions and things that shape how we can live our lives mm -hmm. is a part of health. That's right. um, Marriage provides access if someone is, you know, has insurance or better insurance. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'll, I feel like my mind is just kind of exploding in a thousand directions right now, but um, you know, I, like in speaking with trans and non-binary people, um, this was a, it was a while ago doing an interview study with folks and I was in a Midwestern metropolitan area. Um, it was not so soon after the recession of 2008. 
And one of the questions that I would ask folks, you know, just as an opening question is, what are the challenges um, that you experience in your everyday life as a trans or non-binary person? Um, and a lot of it was, it, it, you know, a lot of folks talked about the economy and not having access to um, wage employment and their, you know, like that, that sets off a cascade of a lot of difficulties in finding housing and affordable housing and food. And also in that city, it's like notorious for being a food desert. Um, and that, that is also linked to the healthcare. So I've just been thinking a lot about how, as I've listened to other folks on this panel, um, the interconnected of institutions and how it can create opportunities for some while also foreclosing others um, based on where someone is situated like in the social structure. So. Thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna shift now to Crystal Edmonds posed uh, a couple of questions actually. How might we think about including so many of these important points and forms of knowledge in different types of curricula. So it goes back to the education piece that we, we talked about earlier. Would teaching these issues look substantially different in medical school, social sciences, humanities, or even technical freshman writing courses? Who wants to, to tackle that? Uh, short answer is yes, <laughs> even with the same person. Um, you know, as a freshman or as a, as a, you know, moving into a medical humanities, you know, major as an undergraduate when they arrive in medical school, like the structure like impels the, 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 the it's a really strong um, intellectual and training that can actually be consistent about their approach across these different structures when they're a student. I think that the demands of medical school are so intensely competency-based, right? How do I make sure I get out of this and believe that I'm not going to hurt people um, when I'm an independent MD? And what, what comes into hurting people is, is rarely the kinds of structural harms that we're talking about today, right? It's more like, how do I know how to be the expert diagnostician or know the right therapy, right? So I think to gain space in medical curricula, it's really imperative to translate those harms as well as those benefits, right? What are the key competencies that, that someone cannot practice a healing art without being able to attend to these vital, these are, these are matters of life and death, right? For all too many people as several of you have named already. Um, for undergraduates, oftentimes so much is dominated by this pernicious category of being pre-medical, right? What a, what a loathsome concept, really, when it comes down to it, to define one's whole liberal arts experience in the basis of some future event that may or may not have happened. So you can have your whole experience invalidated by then not going to medical school. Um, but, so I think there are ways of trying to shift such that... Um, such that there's a there's a positive and there's been a lot of changes. The AAMC has, has changed the the, the the MCAT admissions test. You know emphasizes critical analysis and reasoning skills. The AAMC put together a report on the fundamental role of arts and humanities in medical education just last year. So there's spaces for this, but trying to generate positive spaces rather than um, this is the stuff I do extra while trying to get into medical school. So this is just to say, I don't mean to be insulting towards those undergraduates, those pre-medical students that may be attending today. I'm glad that those are, I'm saying this out of sympathy, right? Which is, this is essential material. Um, and yet I think the context in which one takes this on with as an undergrad, it, 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 the same person will experience this materials in a different way. Um, I, so I guess what I'm arguing for is how to argue the structural basis for why these things need to be present in both spaces, such that, such that they're they are seen as essential elements in, the, in, these, in these programs. I want to believe um, that they might restructure some of medical training, understanding that, you know, what it is and what it does I mean, in terms of what you just spoke about, of like learning not to, you know, actually operate on the wrong limb or whatever, but that, you know, that you would go to American Indian Studies is a discipline actually, of which we don't study Indians. We actually don't study Indians. What we do is we bring the content of, of the multiple indigenous knowledges into the academy 
So we study you through our own lenses, basically, <laughs> whoever the you is. No, we study American society or other societies, you know, in that way. We bring our own knowledges in as a lens. But this is a really good, and a lot of people do take our classes, but they always like people who might even be pre-med. They don't get it until the very, you know, the, the last time in school they can take something that isn't for their major, you know what I'm saying? Because it's not considered, you know, critical when I think it probably should be um, upfront critical that you have to have a real profound humanities education uh, that includes informations from all kinds of peoples. And I just won't name us as marginalized. I'll just name us as other, other experiences of being people and peoples and citizens uh, in these places. Go ahead, Steph. Sorry. Oh yeah, I, I can just quickly kind of, um, I think I have one of the coolest jobs in the world. Um, <laughs> And Lyman Briggs College, which is the primary place where I teach, um, it's it's a residential undergraduate STEM college. We do have a lot of we do have a lot of pre med students. Sorry, Sketchcat really wants to join this conversation. Um, but I remember, like when I first started out in teaching college students, I would really like I would have like. And, I, and it's embarrassing to look back at it now, but like the race unit, the gender unit, the class unit. And now, because I do have a lot of flexibility in what I teach and how I teach, I, I kind of do more of a, I'm looking at um, uh, one of the questions that is in the chat. Um, I tend to zoom in a little bit on an object of inquiry, a practice, or a policy. And then the whole semester is kind of built around the arc of actually, um, uh, Didi, I was thinking about, I, I start sometimes with your work at the beginning of a semester to think through like the historical legacies of racism that shape how we come to understand bodies and different kinds of bodies and practices. Um, and then build into that like an intertwining of how we must understand eugenics, for example, through also the lens of um, ableism and so-called feeble-mindedness. And then that also helps us then understand, you know, so like I'm thinking about, I used to do the, I need to cover all of the things like, but that I think creates a bit of a myopic understanding of how inequality shows up in healthcare. Um, so instead of like trying to cover breadth, I, I mean, and it still happens, but I zoom in on a topic or a body part sometimes and just the whole semester we, we grapple with it and we examine it from like the social, historical, and cultural context that shape and perpetuate oppression. So. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. I am now in a position as a director of a humanities and medicine program where I do shape curricula, but also as a consultant for a lot of me medical organizations and schools, I'm also helping to shape their curricula. So I'll begin with the medical schools um, and that includes schools of nursing as well, doula training programs. It tends to be a little easier for me because a lot of what is on the curriculum tends to be very kind of science evidence-based you know, textbooks. And I'm saying you can diversify just by adding books from people in the humanities and social sciences. And so it becomes easier for me they're also now, because we're in the age of COVID and everything is, is Zoom, you know, a, a video learning. Um, there, there are ways in the learning modules where the medical narrative becomes a really important form of storytelling in education for me that I've incorpor incorporated, which is a part of my own experience um, having a journalism degree, you know, from undergrad. Um, being a mouthy Southerner who likes to talk and tell stories. So, I mean, that's a part of how I incorporate it. For undergrads though, it's it's different. I have to, I'm, I'm a historian by training. I do have training in African-American studies and, and women's studies, but at the, the core of it, I still am very, very centered and anchored in history. And so teaching HMAC courses to people like the, the students Jeremy described, you know, they're all biochem, pre-med, you know, they are very clear they want to be doctors. They are very clear 
that they are rooted in science and having them to think very broadly about the history of the Western medical tradition, but it's being taught by somebody like me, you know? And I'm talking about a world where concept like concepts of race didn't exist 2,500 or 3,000 years ago. And that's my area of specialty. So how do I connect them with something where they don't see these people as just kind of historical flat folk on the page, but to have them think about, these are human beings who are dealing with public health issues and all of those, you know, all of those kinds of things. You know, where do I go pee? You know, <laughs> I mean, just all, all of those kinds of things. And I'm out in the marketplace and it might be 2,700 years ago, but those are the things that they have to contend with. And then when I do urinate, it has to be clean. So I'm constantly having them, I think with all of us are saying, focus on the human being and the human experience. And we just do so through the lens of, of race. I mean, I'm sorry, excuse me, of medicine, but we can bring in all of these things like all of our multiple, multiple identities. So that has prob probably been the most challenging for me, getting the students to real talk, trust that a black woman can teach them about Europe and Western medical thought. Cause they believe me when I talk about race and medicine in the US, Th that I, I can win them over. But having them to actually believe that what I'm saying is, is factual, can be verified, can be critiqued, can be you know, interpreted differently, but at least we're on the same page in terms of the definitions and the understandings of that moment, I think has, has also challenged me to not be so trusting of what I've learned and to shape and shift in terms of the pedagogical experience. So, you know, Crystal, I think that's a, you know, those are, are wonderful ways they show up differently because we are, you know, our, our experiences inform the ways that we teach. I am going to, we have nine minutes. So I'm just gonna, um, I think, did we have, uh, let's see. Um, MLW5019 says, this is so inspiring and relevant for so much more than just the medical humanities. I think we might've answered this, but I'll just say it. How can we prepare undergrads and liberal arts to be the kinds of med students, masters in public health practitioners, et cetera, who go on to post-grad programs in the health fields? So I think we've answered that. So you, you were prescient. Um, uh, let's see. Can I lean into one little bit of that more? Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. I, it, just, it, it comes out of, of something you were, you were just saying there, Didi, which is, you know, but, you know uh, un, by, by giving undergraduates a clear sense of what humanities give them as a set of vital skills, right? And these are skills that can be used in a variety of different arenas, right? Their, their, their utility or, or the worth of the value of time spent studying them is not judged based on whether or not they get into medical school or public health school. But if they do either of these things or nursing school or any of a number of different professional designations or work in health policy, like they can apply them in critical ways. And it comes from stepping out of that pre-medical mentality of thinking, well, you know, my brain is a warehouse and I stack a bunch of sugar cubes in them. And if I stack enough of them of sufficient quality, then they'll, they'll be measured and then I'll get into these things. And, you know, I think, what do we, what do, we do in the humanities? And like you, I, I know history the best. And I, I keep on coming back to history as a discipline whose you know, methods and theories I can, I can em embrace and, and say very clearly. And I believe all the different humanities bring different theoretical methodological frameworks. And I don't want to bland them out to a general thing, the lowest common denominator of what medical humanities do, right? But I do think that, that getting this point that, that, that denaturalizing the structures that we live in, right? Having a set of skills that one learns through humanistic scholarship and study that are applicable in our everyday world because they help us to question and then see forms of violence that are hidden and then find ways of doing things about them. And this is a great skill that health professionals need, but it's great skills that anybody needs. So it's, it's such a positive set to orient, orient what medical humanities are around. Um, but it's also a way in which, as I think several of you pointed out, right, what we're talking about when we talk about medical humanities is just ways the humanities engage with structures of power and living and help us actually find traction in, in the everyday in important ways. Thank you so much for that, Jeremy. I might ask you to provide a guest lecture for my students next semester. So, <laughs> so remember what you just said there. <laughs> All right, so this is from Lily and we only have seven minutes. So um, I'm gonna try and ask the questions uh, posed here in the chat, but Lily says, is there a role for training healthcare workers and specifically nonviolent or compassionate communication with each other and with their patients? Oh and their families. Who wants to 
one or two of us maybe to take that briefly. Who wants to go first? Um, I, I think this is a really interesting question, Lily. And and I think a lot about um like in the social, like in the social sciences, one of the interesting things that happen sometimes is that what people think they do and what they do is often completely divergent. So um you know, like right now, as just a quick example, informed consent models are reigning in trans health and doctors are like informed consent, informed consent. That's what I use. That's what I use. But then asking them, tell me about some of the challenges in working with trans people. Like, can you, can you offer some examples? Uh, what happens is they say they use informed consent. And then when they describe these challenges, instead, what they're using is just good old paternalistic medicine. Um, I'm going to tell you patient what to do. So I, I would, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm like exactly answering your question, but one thing that I would be a little cautious of is that even in giving people language, like healthcare providers language to, to be more compassionate um, or to think about their patients, their families, et cetera, I would just be mindful again of how medical providers might learn language, but still in their practices, like bias and oppression might still show up, so. Thank you. Actually, I'm going to, um, in the interest of time, ask us very briefly, if we can, maybe in 60 seconds or, or, or so, do the elevator pitch before we conclude. But I wanted to end with this question. While the conference theme is a crisis of caring, are there any glimmers of hope in the form of encouraging developments and or trends to which we might point our audience and each other. During COVID-19, our communities came together like no other, other time to help and protect each other. And in some places, um, we had much fewer deaths because we returned to ways that had always had compassion and care in them. And I think it's a good model. So uh, I usually end interview, I like to end interviews on an up note because I, after spending hours with people and talking about challenges and struggle with depression, the question I asked medical providers, and it seemed a little funny at first to me, but actually their responses were beautiful when I said, what are the joyful aspects of, of working with trans people? Um, and for me in my work, I think a lot about, there are a lot of challenges. There's certainly perpetuation of oppression and all these like horrible things. Um, but listening to doctors talk about what are the sources of joy in working with a particular patient population. For example, one of the most common things they talk about is trans patients remind me that I have to slow down that even though the typical annual visit is seven minutes with trans patients, I have to be mindful of to ask what are their names and what are their pronouns and all these things. And that that helps remind me why I got into medicine and how I wanna be with all of my patients. Like I want to get to know my patients and yet there's not always time. Um, or I need to remember, I have to stop making assumptions about my patients that I cannot walk into a room and feel like I know, know who this person is just based on what they're saying. Um, I know I, I do spend a lot of time and I try to be mindful of it, like not, I, I don't wanna damn providers, <laughs> but I also wanna be mindful of just the challenges that they present for trans people. Um, but for me, I think the glimmer of hope is in those answers of what they find joyful and that what they learn is that trans people are not so different and exceptional and other, but if they really pause for a moment, what they realize is that in working with a group of people where they have to like retrain how they think about them, that they want to then transport those ways of being with all of their patients. So. And my, my short answer would be yes as well and building off what Steph said. And I'm trying to think about a, a way in which to connect my answer here with this amazing, um, you know, uh, you know, keynote we're going to be hearing and engaging with with the writer Eula Bliss, um, and uh, you know, uh, Eula Bliss wrote, wrote this essay called "Time and Distance Overcome" about histories of the telephone as a technology that engaged with structures of, of, of devastating racial violence. Uh, 
um, and yet left it you know, open-ended in a way that transformed the way that I found myself thinking about the telephone as another moment in which folks found themselves in, in medicine sort of being hurried up, right? Having these huge promises that access would be leveled to all and made even, which weren't delivered on. And then became part of a way of understanding like this large bureaucratic box that care gets delivered in, in which things need to be faster and faster. And you see these things happening right now with telemedicine, right? With the sense of provider burnout, with a sense of visits are compressed or how much emotional work can you do in this two dimensional you know, box? Um, and yet like Steph, I, I find that there is there is are forms of joy, there's forms of privilege. There's something about the act of care that is enduring and transcendent and continues to actually resist the collapsing into the metrics that we actually place it within. And I don't think that space is coterminous with the humanities, but I do think that every time we try to reduce health or healthcare to a set of diagnoses or treatments or to a set of metrics that can be counted, and you know, we, we realize how much is missing and the kind of economic, the kind of the economization of health fails in so many ways to engage with what actually brings people into healing professions and care in the first place. And so like Steph, I'm seeing trainees do this consistently. I'm seeing practitioners. I realize that I get frustrated in clinic all the time, but I'm still any given week, I'll meet remarkable people and get to learn from their lives and share in their experience. And so there's this way in which that is actually what medical humanities do. And it's what humanities do in general. It's a space that really can't be contracted. And so I see that space as enduring. Um, and I, 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 I'm, it's a privilege to have a chance to be in conversation with you about how to, how to name it and how to actually give it more space to thrive. Thank you. So um, I'm, I will say this very briefly. The glimmer of hope has been uh, the CDC declaring racism as a public health crisis. It has been the institution building that Black people have had for centuries um, that have transformed communities. And I'll end on a positive note. I always use the words of Octavia Butler, philosopher trapped in a novelist's body. And she said, there is nothing new under the sun, but we can always create new suns. And so that is what um, the glimmer of hope is, I think, for all of us. And so with that, thank you to my fellow panelists, Steph, Jeremy, Diane, and to everyone who participated in this conversation, please join us for our next conference session at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time tomorrow, featuring a conversation with author Eula Bliss about her piece, The Pain Scale. Thanks again to everyone for their questions and insightful comments. I look forward to seeing you in the upcoming sessions. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.